We want to welcome back to our table James O'Keefe, who's out with a new book, Breakthrough, Our Guerrilla War to Expose Fraud and Save Democracy. James O'Keefe, what's guerrilla war and why do you do it? Well, guerrilla is uh, a strategy that we use where citizens who took it upon ourselves to investigate and expose corruption, waste, fraud, and abuse in the government and other institutions. Uh, it's guerrilla because uh, we're not really depending on traditional techniques to get the information out there. We're utilizing YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and sometimes we're spending our own money. We're, we're individuals taking on a vast media and government machine. So it's a little bit of asymmetrical warfare, David versus Goliath type of struggle, and that's what this book, Breakthrough, is all about. How do you do it? Walk us through deciding to send in, uh, some people call them undercover actors. Mm -hmm. You have said they're investigative journalists. Walk us through how you decide what you're going to do and, 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 and do it. Well, we get sent dozens of ideas all the time. I get sent, people send me a Facebook message. People send me a tip on, on our Project Veritas website. And I tend to want to visualize things for people. I want to take issues and, and we call it cinema verite. Veritas, Latin for truth, showing people kind of what happens when people aren't looking, or in one case, one of my favorite videos, you know, we wanted to visualize the, the whole economic problem in this country where you dig holes and refill them. So we posed as a group to dig ditches and fill them back in again. We call ourselves Earth Supply and Renewal. And what happens is these people are usually on tape uh, ingratiating themselves to members of our team engaging in exactly the type of absurd things that you would think they would do. Why, ha why do you call them investigative journalists? I mean, are they full-time employees of Project Veritas or are they undercover actors that you have paid to go in? They're, they're, they're reporters who get paid just like any other news corporations, like C-SPAN pays its reporters. I'm sure they do. Um, but we call them journalists because there is a long storied tradition of investigative journalism throughout the 20th century, from Nellie Bly to John Stossel, uh, to Geraldo Rivera, to some of the people with the newspapers in the 1970s and 80s who won awards. In fact, just recently, David Korn of Mother Jones Magazine here in D.C. won a Polk Award for n doing nothing but distributing an undercover tape into Mitt Romney's 47% video. So he's a journalist, and the guy who uh, bugged Mitch McConnell is considered a journalist by the Department of Justice, but for some reason, establishment media does not consider us journalists and that's a question to ask them. And you've been called activists instead, that this is activism not journalism. How do you distinguish between the two? Well, I think that journalism is something that you do. Journalism is not something that you are. You can be an accidental journalist. Journalism is a means to an end. That's getting information out there. If you're getting information out there, uh, especially when you do, in our case, we do it raw. We release full raw video of everything we do. Journ other journalists don't really, in fact, C-SPAN is closest to the th releasing the full raw because you have long segments, but most- Yeah, and, and I should note, we don't have reporters here. I okay. should clarify that, but go No ahead. reporters, but you do have employees right. that you pay that do your segments. We pay our uh, citizen reporters, if you'd call them, we contract that. Sometimes they are volunteers. We do have a number of volunteers. But we release the full raw uh, video to accompany our reporting. So I, I would argue that what we do is closer to you know journalism than anything else. A lot of these other journalists, they package stories, they s manipulate headlines, they uh, assume things in their writing. We just show you the tape and let you decide. Here's a quote from National Review Online who spoke to you ab about the new book and you were quoted as saying this, I liked being hated more than I liked being liked and that's when the game really began. What did you mean? Well, that was actually a quote that I gave Eliana Johnson. Uh, I was quoting uh, what, some, something that Breitbart said in Time Magazine. So that was his quote. Okay. I was, uh, I was utilizing it again. Um, it Does was, it apply to you? To a certain extent. I would say some, no, one, no one really in their heart loves to be hated so deeply. It's actually a sign of respect when they, when they hate you. Um, and, they, and they tend to have a, a love-hate relationship with Project Veritas. But um, it's, it's difficult sometimes, but other times they're, they're using ad hominem. If you look at the book reviews for this uh, book breakthrough, and it's all positive. And the only negative reviews, they're just you know, calling you racist and, and these types of things. So to be called a racist, to be ad hominem attacks, that's a sign of success. And that's how you know you're doing your job right. And 
Initially, there's a barrier to entry for most people. They, they feel like they're very deterred from making a difference. They're scared because of what the media might do to them. And I've been called everything, a white supremacist, I've been called a sexist, I've been called a criminal. And it's, and it's hard at first, but then after a while you, get, you, you break through it, pun intended, and you survive and you keep making a difference. May I ask how old you are? I just turned 29. Okay, and so you started this at, at what age? Uh, well, the book uh, starts off in college. I was 20, just about to turn 21, and I started an independent newspaper at Rutgers. The, the first scene in the, in the book about college is when the dean leans into me. This is the dean of, uh, I believe, student affairs at Rutgers, and she says, James, a respectable journalist does not cause all this controversy. And that was my first lesson in soft tyranny when the dean leaned in and said that. The reason I ask is, I'm wondering, is for, for people who are just learning about the book, is this a biography? It's a manifesto of war. It's an, a little bit of an autobiography. It's a, it's, a, it's a field manual, a hand guide for people who want to do this. It's sort of a combination of a couple different genres. It's been called a thriller novel, more so than a political book. It reads more like Gulliver's Travels, is what Gavin McGinnis, co-founder of Vice, said. You're kind of on this journey, this adventure, as you, as you traipse around the country, uh, going into government places, being attacked, being prosecuted. The book starts off with me in federal jail for a crime I didn't commit. So it's not your typical memoir. It's not retrospective. It's, I don't know what I'll, I'll be thinking 20, 30 years from now. It's, in the, it's an action book, fast-paced uh, manual for how to do what I do. And you say, uh, our guerrilla war to expose fraud and save democracy. Save democracy from what? Well, we, this is a republic. It's a democratic republic. Uh, people, especially Tea Partiers, are always saying, why didn't you say republic? Well, really what we're trying to do is bring power back to the people. We be, you know, I believe that they've taken our uh, public officials have abused the power that we've lent them, and there are extraordinary mechanisms in place to prevent us from re reclaiming that power. So the only way that I can see that we can reclaim it is not even through voting anymore. It's through exposure, it's through sunlight. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. So we expose the fraud, and every time we do it, we outrage people. People are excited, they want to get involved in the democratic process. So saving democracy, what we mean is getting people involved, power back to the people, giving them a voice. And there are rules in this book. Where do the rules come from? Well, I read Rules for Radicals by Saul Linsky 2004, well before he became as much of a household name as Alinsky became when he uh, inspired Clinton and oh, President Obama. Uh, I decided to create the Veritas rules. These are rules that I have, I have uh, learned through the uh, cold, hard knocks of experience. I've had to sort of find my way through legal and media swamps that I don't believe many journalists have found themselves swimming through. And you know, there are all these different rules. One rule is, if you're if you're doing undercover reporting, always always make sure that you extract the tape because if you don't, if they if the if you are arrested and they take your tape away, they'll they'll accuse you of doing anything, and people will believe it. Uh, this is just a simple rule to live by. Another rule is uh, always use props, like we use you know, the pimp costume in the acorn videos, and that just made all the difference, apparently. Um, uh, there are other rules include, um, you know, never spend any, no, no disrespect to you, to you at C-SPAN, but never, never spend any more than 24 hours in the Washington, D.C. beltway. Uh, <laughs> this is something that I've learned the hard way. There's a couple incredible stories about, about uh, fire I've had to face here in Washington, D.C. And you are here in Washington, D.C. today uh, because you were, uh, probation was, was lifted uh, back right. in May. This is what you wrote on May 29th on sure. your website. I have endured 1,212 days of unjust government surveillance and oppression, but today I am a free man. Can you explain to those that don't know the backstory? Yes, it's kind of, it's kind of complicated, but it's an incredible, tragic story about how the government, the federal government, Three and a half years ago charged me with a crime I did not commit in Louisiana. I was walking into a federal building. I was asking, I intended to ask Senator Landrieu's staffers whether or not they were ignoring her phone calls, her constituents' phone calls. She said that her phones were jammed. So all I was going to do was tape them in an off-guarded moment, either saying their phones are fine or they want to shut them down. Uh, unfortunately, the U.S. Marshals arrested me on the spot and assumed I was there to do something much worse, like tamper with phones, and they, they arrested me. And the federal dr judge deleted the contents of my recordings so that nothing, no one could see what I was actually there to do. I was sentenced to three years of probation 
with travel restrictions, fines, and community service, and they would not let me leave the state of New Jersey for three years without permission from a judge, a U.S. attorney, and a probation officer.